Hi, I'm David Freck, lead pastor of Church of the Harvest, and thanks for joining us for our rebroadcast of the sermon that we preached this past week. No matter what part of the week you're in, whether it's the morning, midweek, or in the evening, we're just glad you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And we believe the Word of God helps you do that. We're committed to it. We believe it'll change your life. We believe you'll be inspired, you'll be encouraged, you'll be challenged, and we want you to respond. So would you do that when you listen to this message? If you feel God speaking something into your heart or if there's something we can pray with you about, there's many ways you can do that. You can see that in the description below. We encourage you to do that. God bless you. Thanks for joining us and have an amazing experience as you listen to the Word of God. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to take you to the book of John. Uh, as you know, we've been trying to move through this, what we call this path to Pentecost. And this path to Pentecost started at the moment of Jesus' resurrection and is going to end on Pentecost Sunday. Now, for us, that's June, the first Sunday in June. But Pentecost is an important event in the church's history, just like the resurrection was an important event in human history, right? So it's critical that we understand the link between the resurrection and Pentecost. And I think it's important for believers today to understand it's just not historical events, but these are living events. These are events that are alive. They're alive today. They're eternally alive. They're alive in believers' heart through resurrection, through salvation, and they're alive in believers' heart, but through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So these are, these are living events. These are living realities that exist right now in our time. And it's important that they exist in us, that the, we know the power of resurrection, because if you don't know that, you don't know what regeneration or salvation is. And if we don't have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, then we're going to literally uh, operate on just simply a, a limited impact Christianity. And I, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live my Christian life in limited impact. I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. I want to be graced with his gifts. I want to be led by his anointing. I want to know his power when I pray. Come on, has anybody got this? And so, and so this is all. Now, there were two reasons. Uh, there were two emphases of this time, this 50-day period between resurrection and Pentecost. And the two emphases are simply this. Jesus wanted to reveal himself alive, prove that he had been resurrected. So he did that multiple times. In fact, we're going to discover 10 times. And then he was also prepping them for the Holy Spirit's empowerment. So these were the two initiatives for this 50-day period. The, these, were, these were what mattered. Because this is a journey to Holy Spirit empowerment. Now, as anybody knows, when you go through a great experience, a great event, or even a traumatic experience, how many would agree the death and resurrection of Jesus might qualify as a bit traumatic, as a bit emotionally, mentally, spiritually, well, let's be honest, exhausting. Come on, they, I mean, they're living on the edge of life and death. Their mind is running in a thousand directions. Their emotions are, are, are experiencing everything from absolute bewilderment and confusion and grief and sorrow to the heights of, is this real? Is it possible? Is it, a, is it fictitious? Is it a lie? Is, is, it even, is this even a possibility? And then Jesus showing up and, and, and blundering through, how do I relate to this? And so can you imagine emotionally and mentally and spiritually how you, you would navigate those few days? Has anybody ever had a few days like that? And now, listen, there's nothing can compare to that. But, but, but you can compare it to maybe events in your life, right? Things that happened that you weren't expecting or that fell upon you or that traumatized you or kind of set you back. And, and certainly, death and resurrection, the cross and the resurrection certainly frames that. And so, sometimes you just need a break. You, ju you just need a break. And, and, and sometimes, you're like, it's like you get up and you're having a hangover, now, most of you have never had a hangover in real life, but I did once. 
and, and I want to I want to I want to share with you. I mean, you're kind of in this fog. You're kind of sick. You're kind of you, you, you're kind of exhausted. You're in this haze. You're you 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 kind of have to grind it out, grit it out. Nothing in you is tracking right. You, things feel disconnected. And and so when when you look up the definition of hangover, it means something remaining behind from a former period or state of affairs. So a hangover is, if we think of it in the classic sense, it's it's the residual effect of being drunk. Okay, you don't have to amen me, but it's what it is. Okay? And, 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 And any aftermath or a lingering effect from a distressing experience. So that's a hangover. And and so Let's understand that Jesus shows up in this hangover period. He shows up 10 times. I want to just frame them for you. He shows up at the tomb to Mary. He shows up on the road to Jerusalem to the women. He shows up on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples. He shows up with Peter alone, according to the scriptures. He shows up in the upper room without Thomas. He shows up in the upper room again with Thomas eight days later. He shows up again, and we're going to talk about this, at the Sea of Tiberias. He's going to show up there. He's going to show up at the mountain where he extends the Great Commission. He's going to show up in the upper room where he's going to tell them to go preach the gospel to all nations. And then finally, he's going to show up at the Mount of Olives where he is taken up in the ascension. These are, these are the moments when Jesus physically shows up. This happens during this period of 40, well, it's called 47 days, not quite 50 days. And, and so when you're in a hangover, when you're in a haze, when you're mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually exhausted, what do you need? You need a vacation. Anybody? Anybody? How many of you like, I, I, I would like a year-long vacation, please. There's only five honest people in the room. Vaca- a little vacay sounds awesome. If I didn't have to live, if I didn't have to make money, right? Vacation sounds great. And so they decide, the disciples, reasonably so, because it's now been, it's probably been some day, it's probably been some time. It's, it, it, I, would, I, would, I would guess that it's been a couple of weeks. So they're kind of in the middle. They're in the middle of this waiting period, this uncertainty They don't have a lot of direction from Jesus. He just kind of keeps popping up. And the last time they met with Jesus was in the upper room when when he he revealed himself to Thomas. He said, stick your hand here, stick your fingers here. And and, and he dealt with his doubt. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And and now they're kind of like in this la-la land and they just decide, we need a break. We need to disconnect we need to get away, so they go to the Sea of Tiberias. Now, this is where we're going to pick up the story. Grab your Bibles if you have one. If you don't, we have it up here on the screen. John chapter 21, and we're going to read several verses here to kind of frame the story. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Now, this is just a fancy way of saying the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias was actually a little city on the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, uh, in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Now, how bad do you have to be that he doesn't even name the other two disciples? But anyhow, let's keep going. <laughs> We're together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Yeah. Woo! Come on, you Midwest people, you understand this. Yeah. I'm going fishing. I'm going to Branson. I'm going to the Lake of the Ozarks. I'm going to Hillsdale, wherever you go. And they said to him, we're going to go with you. Sounds great. Let's go. They went out, got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking. Now, where are they? They're in Tiberias. Let's, uh, and I'll frame this for you in a minute. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children... Do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. (laughs) Now let's remember several of the people that are in the boat are professional fishermen. 
Let's remember that. And let's be real honest. In a span of about five feet, is there really a difference? So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul the net in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, by the way, this is John. And let's just understand John's writing this, so come on. Let's keep going. Therefore, he said, to, he said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment because he was stripped for work. How many like that kind of job? And threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. So the, the, probably the most experienced fishermen jumped out of the boat when the work started. For they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish already laid out on it. And wait a second, did Jesus just ask him if they had any fish? When he had the supply already? Let's keep going. With fish laid out and bread. This is nice. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. Now he's going to work. Full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. So there's a miracle not just in the catch, but there's a miracle in the preservation of the net. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast, for none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to them a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, if you've ever been in a conversation with a, sp a spouse or maybe a girlfriend or a boyfriend, if you've ever been in that conversation and they keep asking you if you love them, how does that make you feel? It's making you feel like they don't believe that you love them. Anybody? I want to preach, but I'll, I, I got to keep reading. Peter was grieved, right? He was, he was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. In other words, just don't believe me. I, I'm trusting that because you're God, because you know everything, you know my heart. You know I'm not lying to you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry, where, carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Everybody say it with me. Follow me. Follow me. Can I give you some lessons in rest, some lessons in leisure? Because I think it's important that we learn to rest in our walk with God. I think that there are essentially a couple kinds of people that have faith, a couple kinds of Christians. The, the first kind of Christian is the works-oriented one, which most of us are. We get saved, and then it's about, I'm trying to earn and deserve everything God does for us. Yeah, yeah, sure. and, and I understand the motive behind that, and I understand the initiative behind that, and, and sometimes we're doing it to gain his approval or to earn or deserve his approval, and either way, you can't get it that way, but it's, it's in our nature. We can't avoid what's in our nature. The other kind of Christian is the kind of Christian who does the work as an expression of appreciation. I'm not doing it to earn anything. I just want to do it because I want to show you how much I'm thankful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To whom much is given, much is thankful, the scriptures say. 
And so there's this idea that I, I, I'm going to work and do for you out of an attitude of gratitude, not because I'm trying to earn something, but because I'm trying to show you how thankful I am. Then there's that other kind of Christian who they get saved and they said, check that one. Now I'm going to go do what I want to do because I've added Jesus to my life. Don't talk me down. I've been doing this 40 years. Trust me. And and so there's this this reality that there are people that do it because they're trying to earn something. There's people that are trying to do it because they're trying to express gratitude. And then there's people that, that just are checking boxes. They want to make sure they're going to get to heaven. They want to make sure that they've got a ticket punched. And that's how they relate to this thing called Christianity. Now, in all three expressions, there's truth in all of them, but they're not the fullest expression of who Jesus is in our life. And in every one of those environments, there's not real rest. But the disciples, in the middle of their trauma, in the middle of their uncertainty, in the middle of their hangover, they make a decision, we're checking out. We're going to go to Tiberias, and Tiberias is this city that was created by uh, Herod, and he built it to honor Tiberius Caesar, and he did it basically to kind of, you know, warm up to him, butter him up, get get on his good side, so on and so forth, so he named it after Tiberius, and and it's it's a resort community. That's exactly what it is, so if you were going to Tiberius, you were going to vacation. It's like, you know, I don't know, going to the hot springs, wherever those are. And and by the way, there were hot springs in Tiberias. I mean, world-renowned hot springs. And there were special acropolises. And there was uh, there was fun things to do. And there was lots of market, lots of shopping. It was a it was a place people would go. The 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 Sea of Galilee there is beautiful. It's markedly beautiful. It was restful. It was protected from weather, so you could actually get out, enjoy some of the beaches. So it was just one of those great places within that region that you could go and you could disconnect and you could unwind and, and you could go to the resort and it was all paid for and they'd bring you your food and drinks all day long like uh, Cancun. And, and so this is just kind of the world that they're in. But, but, but Peter, even, even in this time of leisure, he's like, I want to go back to what's familiar I'm going to go, I'm tired of just sitting around here drinking Mai Tais. Non-alcoholic, of course. I just don't, I just don't feel like this is getting anything done, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of just having my feet up and, and sunning and tanning and eating good food, and, because how many know that, that sometimes that just gets old? But let's understand that when they make the decision to go out, and, and to rest, that it's this environment that Jesus decides to reveal himself. And I want to say to you that sometimes we're working to find Jesus when Jesus says, no, I'm not revealed in your work, I'm revealed in your rest. I'm revealed in the seasons when you're not really sure what to do or how to do it or where to go or what to think. And if you'll just rest in me. In fact, Hebrews gives us this affirmation that says, listen, we didn't enter into his promises because of or enter into his rest because of unbelief. In other words, it's our, it's our desire to try to do something to make God reveal himself or to make God show himself. If I pray more and if I, if I sing more and if I read more Bible verses and if I do more Bible studies and if I go to more church, and all that stuff's great. But folks, there's times when you just got to rest. And you just got to say, Lord, I'm here. I'm available. If you want to show up, I'm willing to listen. And I'm going to suggest that sometimes we got to get all the crowded stuff out of our head and out of our mind and out of our energies before we'll ever see what Jesus wants to reveal. But how many know, just like Peter, even when we're resting, it can get tiring to just sit around. And that's where Peter was. And so what does Peter want to do? Peter wants to go back to what he used to be and to what he used to do. And you need to understand that you can, once you really meet Jesus and you really get purpose from him, returning to who you were will never truly be productive. Because he went back to who he was and he caught nothing. Come on, somebody. 
I'm going to tell you, once you made a decision for Jesus, going back to who you were will never be the same as it was before you met him. You might think, hey, I'll just go back and I'll do what I used to do and I'll go where I used to go and I'll do the things I used to, and you'll discover when you get there, it just doesn't have the same bling and bang that it used to have. It's missing something. Anybody tracking with me? And I see people do this all the time. They, 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 they stumble in their relationship or the God does something they don't get or something happens in their life that they can't frame in their theology. And the very first thing they want to do is they want to go back to where they used to be. And they go back there and they find that it's even more empty and more unproductive than it was before they started, before they met Jesus. And now they're really in no man's land. So they spent all night being unproductive. Can there be anything more frustrated than that? They're wounded, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're trying to figure out something to do. They don't want to sit around anymore, so they go back to doing what they used to do. And now when they're doing what they used to do, it's unproductive, it's un- it has no value. And, and they're sitting there, and they're sitting in an empty boat, and they're, they're just literally head in hands trying to manage where they are in life. And then they hear this voice. Children... Do you have any fish? I'll rub it in, Lord. God wants to point us to our lack of productivity without him. He wants to show us. How's that working for you? Is that working out okay? Are you you killing it without me? Whoop, whoop. Your strengths working out, you're managing the process well, look at you, go, come on. You got any fish? No. I'll tell you what, why don't you take the net from this side of the boat, drag it five feet across to the other side of the boat, and drop it, and you'll find some there. And they're not just going to find one or two folks, they're going to find a net full. Come on, you, you, you got to understand, in the context of that reality, how miraculous and supernatural this event is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and here's the lesson in leisure. Here's the lesson. Obeying Jesus always creates productivity. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if it doesn't naturally fit. Even though a professional fisherman says, listen, the fish from here... To no fish here and fish here. Come on, if I've got it over here, some of them have got to end up over here. Just by the process of swarm. They've got to end up over here. Except for God commands the fish. God commands Productivity. And it's our alignment with him that creates it. Not our need to do it, but our alignment with him. I wish somebody was listening to me. This is true in business. This is true in life. This is true in marriage. This is true in parenting. Obeying Jesus is what creates productivity. And so sure enough, they take the net out, they throw it on the other side, bam! Like Emerald Lagasse, bam! Bam! And then something interesting happens. And and I think that this is, you know, Peter, he's like, okay, I've been here before. I've seen him do this kind of stuff before. Remember, he did this earlier with them. He's like, and he puts on his clothes to jump in the water, which makes all kinds of sense. Puts on his clothes, jumps in the water, swims to Jesus. It's only 100 yards. Most of us can do that. Jumps, goes in, runs up there. Jesus is there. He's not saying anything, but he's acknowledging that I'm available. I'm here. You just showed me I'm unproductive without you. I'm not going to align myself with the boat anymore. I'm not going to align myself with my past anymore. I'm not going to align myself with what I used to be, what I could have been, where I would have gone, how I would have worked. I'm going to align myself with you. And if that means I'm standing on a beach because you're standing on a beach, that's good enough for me. If that means I'm sitting at your fire because it's your fire, that's good enough for me. I don't want to be anywhere where you aren't. I don't want to do anything that you haven't commanded. I don't want to, I don't want to function in any way that doesn't function for you. Because here's the lesson. Relationship 
is more important than success. This is the thing that matters to Jesus, is that we have relationship with him. We pursue success, but relationship is what matters. And here's how Jesus approaches it. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus goes right to this. Now, let's understand something. While Peter has been at most of the events where Jesus has revealed himself, it is clear that in none of the previous revelations of Christ that Jesus has ever dealt, nor has Peter ever dealt, with his weak moment. They haven't talked about his denial. They haven't talked about the campfire when Jesus looked over and saw him and then he ran away and wept. That, that, they haven't gone there. Oh, we've talked with Dr. Thomas and his doubt. But for some reason, it's a conversation that Peter doesn't want to have And apparently Jesus doesn't either until today. Don't you hate it when you know it's coming? Isn't that the worst part? It's coming. And then, then, but Jesus does it in such a confrontational, non-confrontational way. John, Peter, I'm sorry, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than what? Than success, more than 153 big fish that I gave you, that I provided for you, that I made sure got in your net. Do you love me more than the success I create? Do you love me more than your productivity? Do you love me more than your prosperity? Do you love me more than my provision? Do you love me more than a season of rest? Do you love me more than your past? Do you love me more than who you were identified to be before me? Do you love me more than these? Now, this word love is important. It's agape. We're going to talk about it in a minute. And and Peter replies as though he didn't hear the word agape. Because agape is a place he doesn't know if he can get to. Because in our natural, we can't get there. In our capabilities, we can't get to agape. I can't will myself into agape. I can't make a decision to agape. It is a God-ordered love. It is a God-supplied love. So Peter's going to give him the apex of his ability. The apex of what he knows he can forage up. Lord, you know I phileo you. And so Jesus just takes him at his word and says, okay, then feed my lambs. Because the relationship piece with Jesus is ultimately this. It is rooted in love. Now, I want to define, I'm going to take a little extra time, but is anybody surprised? (laughs) So, so I I want to define agape for you. Agape is the Greek verb that it means the highest, most perfect kind of love. Okay. It, is, it implies a clear determination of will and judgment belonging to and originating in God. In other words, it's choice and decision, God-informed. God-instructed, God-empowered. I can't get to agape independent of God's influence. Now, when, when the Bible says God is love, it doesn't, it's not God is phileo, or God is eros. Come on, come on. It is God is agape. Right, right. Wow. You want to be resourced in love? It's God. Amen. It's agape. 
Now, phileo is the one that we're most familiar with, where we get Philadelphia, so on and so forth. That means natural human affection. It's, it's the idea of strong feelings. This is where most of the world, most of the world, we've actually, we've actually kind of defunded down out of phileo. The world today thinks love is eros. Yeah. 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 Totally. Sexual love. If, 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 if you make me feel good, then that's love. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. But that's not, now this is the height of human expression. Of love. This is the height, of, did you hear that? It's the height of the human expression of love based in our human emotions, based in our human abilities. Loving with emotion, strong emotion, brotherly kindness. It's, it's me being gracious and generous and capable and loving, and it is a, an authentic form of expression in love. So don't, don't think that it's not, it is. And, and a, it can look a lot like agape. The difference is how it's produced. Because you'll hear it when the argument starts between the spouse or between the parent and the kid. And they'll say, I'm not loving you right now. What? I've heard stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not loving them right now. Okay. You're clearly in phileo because you're not feeling it. You're clearly in phileo because you're not feeling it. But agape is I'm in. You're an idiot, but I'm in. You're driving me crazy, but I'm in. And you're not the source of it, and my emotions are not the source of it, and the events around me are not the source of it. It's God that's the source of it. So, so let, me, let, me, let me go back to the three questions that Jesus asked. The three questions were, do you... Here are the questions. Do you agape me? Do you, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Two times. Then look what he does. For Peter's sake, he dumbs it down. The last time he asks him, he says, okay, do you really phileo me? Okay, you're you're contending that you phileo me. Now let me deal. You've made it clear you can't agape. You're getting that. You understand I can't do that. So you've been telling me for the last two times that you phileo me. Do you really? Come on. Okay, if that's where you want to go, let me test you there. <laughs> that was my French laugh. <laughs> so, out of each question, what happens? A commission. Peter answers the same, time, same way every time, but there's three commissions that come out of these three questions. The first commission is, if you love me, if you agape me, if you phileo me, right, then feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Now, lambs mean they're the young, young sheep. They're the little sheep. And he's saying, feed, teach, nurture, develop, care for the young and the new in faith. Don't, don't just limit yourself to the people that are with you and like you, but reach back and find the people that aren't where you are yet, that are just getting this thing figured out, and feed them. Then the second time he says, take care of my sheep. That's the language he uses, take care. Now this, this is not just feeding, this is, this is pastoring, this is shepherding. It's this idea of direct direction, protection, care, nurturing, leading. This is the responsibilities of a shepherd. He said, I want you to, I want you to do the things that aren't just associated with teaching, but are the practical mechanisms to help lead, to help protect, to help care for, to help nurture the flock. In other words, if you notice something, he's converting Peter from a fisherman to a shepherd. He said, all right, you, you've jumped out of your boat. You're letting go. Do you love me more than the, do you love me more than the fish, than the things that you can do well, than the things that make sense to you? Do you love me more than that? Because if you do, I'm going to call you to be a different kind of person. I'm going to call you to function in a different way. Take care of my sheep. And the last time when he says, do you phileo me, feed my 
sheep. Teach the flock. That's what the word feed. Teach the flock. Don't just care for them, but teach them. So here's the lessons about love. Because if we're going to get to empowerment, if we're going to get to Holy Spirit empowerment, we got to deal with the love question. This journey with Jesus, this path to Pentecost, is about getting them out of their confusion, their disorientation, their uncertainty, and bringing them into a place of true empowerment. And we got to deal with our doubts if we're going to get there. We got to deal with our fears if we're going to get there. We got to deal with the love question if we're going to get there. Because here's what matters loving Jesus. And this is the source of it all. Loving Jesus is what motivates real service. Loving Jesus. If you're going to do something for me, do it because you love me. I don't want you just doing it because it's a job or it's a responsibility or it's a way you can measure your success or when I go to a pastor's conference, how big is your church? But it's this idea that the reason I do what I do is because I'm in love with Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you something. You can't do the sheep thing if you don't love the shepherd, the true shepherd, the great shepherd. Because I'm telling you, sheep are cray-cray. And you got to get something more from God than just the resource of what the sheep can do for you. Because I, as I've discovered, I know that the shepherd gets some benefit and some bling out of this deal, but that's really not the purpose behind it. you got to fall in love with Jesus. And if you can fall in love with Jesus, then it makes it easy or easier to manage the context of the shepherds. Now, you're thinking, well, this is only about pastors. No, it's not. It's about you and me because we've all been called to shepherd things. You're either fishing, trying to put something on your plate, or you're nurturing because you love. And it's about your marriage, and it's about your children, and it's about your job, and it's about your business, and it's about your relationships. Loving Jesus is what motivates me. Here, here, here's another, here's another go-to. Loving Jesus is really what matters to Jesus. I don't care. Listen, I can produce, I can give you success, great. Here, it's, success is for you. It's not for me. I'm already successful. I don't need anybody to ring my bell. I don't need anybody to give me a high five and an attaboy. I got it. Loving Jesus is what matters to Jesus. Do you love me? If you love me, this is how it'll look. If you love me, this is what you'll do. If you love me, this is how you'll talk. If you love me. How many things do we do for God because we think that that's what he wants? When all he wants us to do is sit around a campfire and talk to us. We do all of that for us. Let's be honest. And, and, and here's, another, here's another one. Hurry up, worship team. I need you. Come, come. <laughs> Loving Jesus is why we love what Jesus loves. <laughs> notice, notice he says, if you love me, you're going to love what I love. You're going to love the sheep. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I, 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 I can't love some of y'all. I, I, most of you I can, but there's a few of you. Come on. Right? But, but I love Jesus. Yeah, it's you I'm talking about, Pastor Royce. Um, <laughs> loving Jesus is why we love what Jesus loves. It's interesting when you, I, I see it in my wife all the time. I see that because I like something, she'll like it. I know she doesn't like it. I know she doesn't. I know, but she loves me. Therefore, she endures the things that I like and love. You'll do a lot of things for love. And, and you won't grind your teeth over it. Ultimately and finally, I'm done. 
loving Jesus is how we persevere. Do you remember how Jesus ends his statement with Peter? He says, Peter, when you were younger, you could dress any way you wanted and go anywhere you wanted to go. But when you get older, somebody else is going to lead you. Somebody else is going to dress you. And you're going to go someplace you don't want to go. He was talking about how he was going to die. And Peter, you can't go to the uncomfortable place unless you love me. Because I love you, we're going to have this conversation today. Because I love you, I'm not holding over your head that you denied me. I'm not going to hold over your head that you cursed me. I'm not going to hold over your head that you ran from me and was afraid of a little girl. I'm not going to hold that over your head. I'm just going to invite you to fall in love with me again. Because there's going to be a day when more is going to be demanded of you. And it's going to be demanded of you because you love me. I'd like to tell you that loving Jesus is always easy, and it's always going to ask the easy thing from us, but sorry, guys. It's just not the nature of real love. Do you remember Jesus when he was talking to the church in Ephesus, and he said this? He says, I have a complaint about you, and here it is. You've left your first love. You don't love me like you used to. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back. Turn back. And do the things you did at first because you were motivated by love, not because of the works, but because you were motivated by, how, by what, what motivated you. Repent. If you don't, I'm going to come and I'm going to take your lampstand. I'm going to take the way you see things away. I'm going to take your ability to be illuminated. You're going to be in the dark because love is your light. So, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for rushing in to this moment, helping us to answer the love question, do you love me? Father, I pray today that we would fall madly, deeply in love with you. Stand to your feet all over the room, would you? If you're watching online, I pray that right where you are, in your chair or at your dining room table or in your bed, wherever you are, that you would just close your eyes and lift your heart toward heaven. And just imagine yourself around a warm fire where Jesus is going to meet your needs, but he's going to invite you into a loving, a, a deeper love relationship with him. Holy Spirit, visit us this morning. Maybe you're here in this room and you've lost your first love. If you have, it just takes turning towards him. Renewing it. Maybe you've never fallen in love, but today you feel the compelling grace of God drawing you to him. And if that's true, we want to pray with you. So as our ministry team comes and we prepare ourselves for interaction with God. You can give, you can do communion, you can worship, you can have prayer over anything, but if you're in that love scenario, you wanting to renew or recommit, can I invite you? to just, Even if you don't want to come and pray with us, just come in and present yourself and just fall to your knees and just say, Lord, here I am. But let's engage God together in Jesus' name. Amen.